about a nice pastrami sandwich? How about a big slice of cheesecake? How about the two of them together? Well, you can't do that. At least not in a proper kosher meal. Because meat and dairy products can never be eaten together, a distinctive style of cooking emerged called dairy. You used to be able to find dairy restaurants in every major American city, but today only a few survive. Perhaps the most famous is Ratner's on New York's Lower East Side. We probably serve as many onion rolls and ran as... With poppy seeds, uh, Right, huh? as McDonald's has been serving hamburgers, <laughs> if you want to use them. Oh, i got to try this. But the first thing, people mm -hmm. come into the restaurant, they sit down, the first thing they get is a basket of onion rolls. In fact, when my grandfather started Bratton's, for 15 cents, you could come in, get a bowl of soup, as many rolls as you want, and a cup of coffee. And the, I think the 15 cents even include the waiter's gratuity. Wow. So, so I mean, you know, prices have changed a little bit over the, the past 90 years. Unfortunately, traditional dairy restaurants like Ratner's are a vanishing species. However, in Los Angeles, where everything old is new again, dairy is being reinvented with a distinct Hollywood touch. Leah Adler, who's known in some circles as Steven Spielberg's mother, is the founder and guiding spirit of a wonderful eclectic but strictly dairy restaurant called the Milky Way. This is an upscale dairy calm, wonderfully atmospheric restaurant. Why did you open a dairy restaurant? Madness, <laughs> madness. total madness. Uh, 20 years ago, my husband got involved with religion and became orthodox which was great, except to cut off my water. I couldn't eat out anymore. Right. I mean, I was the, raw, those cl crabs. the raw clams on half shell, <laughs> queen of the world. Uh -huh. And um, he was the director of Lockheed's computer department, but a very innovative, imaginative guy. And he was so bored being an engineer. So somebody jokingly said to us, why don't you open a kosher restaurant now that you're kosher? So we did. And you had all these little children. Did you cook for them? I'm a good cook. I'm a real good cook, but see, I have theories. This less is more. If it has more than five ingredients, I don't mess with it. Mm -hmm. I think things begin to taste like garbage at a certain point. It's muddied up. But um, I remember my, one of my kids was like three, and something was wrong with her mouth, like ulcerated. And I took her to the dentist, and he said, my god. What is the child in eating? <laughs> well, my curry. <laughs> my kids loved what I made. My children always were into spicy foods with me. Your son, Stephen, was very much involved in theatrical things, not as an actor, but sort of behind the scenes. Was he ever in the kitchen with you? Only the time we ruined my cabinetry. Tell me. OK, so we have this beautiful house in Scottsdale with rubbed ash cabinets rubbed with white. And she was doing a film, and he wanted a scene to be an explosion <laughs> of a pressure cooker uh -huh. in which cherries were cooking. So Mommy went to the store and bought cans of cherries and heavy syrup, opened them all up. He's got this kind of setup. I mean, I'm used to these lights, kids. And you can break your neck in my house on dollies and cables. So he has everything ready, and I threw the contents of all of these cans of cherries on my white cabinets. And as they're real slowly oozing down, he's shooting like crazy. And it was a great scene. Lived in that house for eight years. Never got the cherry juice out of the wood. Every morning, I'd get up, go in the kitchen, put on the coffee, and take the sponge and go like this. And I keep wondering, we sold the house, did these people have this seepage? And did they know what it was? And who did it? <laughs> it's a great story. I know you were born in Cincinnati. On your menu here, is there anything from your Cincinnati background? Well, the cheese blintzes are my mother's settlement cookbook recipe, page oh. 81. <laughs> and all the pages are now stuck together. Smudged. Here. Smudged and sticky. Right. And it's the done with cottage cheese. It's one of the older recipes, and it's just wonderful. Very right. nostalgic stuff. Well, there's something about that settlement cookbook. Yeah. Actually, somebody emailed me that if I came to Milky Way, I had to have the cheese blintzes. I know people come in. I can tell by looking. They're brand new. They come in, and I say, you're having blintzes? No question. That's what brings them in, right. keeps them coming back. 
I had to try a little of everything. The blintzes are great. And where else could I sample such kosher delicacies as pasta with parmesan and roasted pistachios or chimichangas topped with guacamole? Obviously, if you're inventive, almost anything can be the basis of a great dairy meal. Molly Katzen is the author of that Bible of vegetarian cooking, the Moosewood Cookbook. What about uh, vegetarianism and Judaism? Well, as you of all people mm -hmm. well know, um, in a typical Jewish home, a traditional Jewish home, there is a very kind of very broad boundary between the meat meal and the dairy meal. Mm -hmm. And I did grow up in a home where meat and dairy were separate, and separate mm -hmm. dishes and separate silverware. And um, Thursday night was our dairy night. Mm -hmm. And that was the night that we had the vegetarian food. But it wasn't called vegetarian food, it was called dairy. Mm -hmm. And we had about 5,000 dishes on Thursday nights because, of course, the, the <laughs> we had like a hunk of meat and a potato and a vegetable frozen the other nights. But um, <laughs> Thursday night was our, our vegetarian, or our, excuse me, our dairy meal. And of course, because you'll go hungry if you don't have the meat, we had the kugel and we had the coleslaw and we had the other kugel and we had the noodles and we had the bread and we had the fish and, um, and the soup with the barley. And, um, it became that that was the most interesting cooking of the mm -hmm. week because it wasn't just the hunk of meat, but it, it was casseroles and kugels with different things in them. So I, I again got sparked by that. I see. And also vegetarianism and Judaism were very compatible. Isn't, uh, didn't it harken back to the book of Genesis and the uh, Noah's Ark that they say that before the flood that Jews were vegetarians? That's true. And then of course that simplifies the choices that Jews have to make when there, there's confusion about whether meat, something has meat in it or not, it's kind of a safe choice. It's also a very agrarian, very earth-conscious choice, and the Jews had been an agrarian people. So that, that all falls into place. And, and also, I think the very religious will often go to a, a, a strict vegetarian restaurant, even though it isn't necessarily a kosher restaurant, because... They can trust it. They can trust it. Yeah, no one's trying to poison them there. Right. Right. <laughs> Well, and of course, beets go beets. into this. Oh, beets. And you know, it's so much fun to realize that we both have beet borscht recipes in our cookbooks. There's right. a very original Moosewood cookbook, beet borscht. And it's interesting for me because, let me just start cutting this beet, okay. since cutting beets when they're not yet cooked sometimes takes a little, a little while. Um, when I grew up, I have to confess, my mother and grandmother made some things from scratch, but beet borscht they bought in a jar mm -hmm. at the store. Right. And it, to me, I, my food literacy was such that I thought that it was this magical pink soup. Right. I, had, I didn't associate it with a vegetable called a beet. <laughs> it was just this, this beautiful, sweet. cold, sweet stuff that we'd put the sour cream in. And later on, I learned that it actually was made from a vegetable called beets. Mm -hmm. It grew in the ground. <laughs> Duh. Right. Duh. And, um, and so I wanted to come up with a way to make it from scratch, which I, I didn't really know. It wasn't in my family tradition. I don't know mm -hmm. if it was in yours to make beet borscht from scratch. No. It wasn't. So well, you bought it from a jar, too? Well, we didn't even buy it from a jar. We didn't really eat it growing up. I was from a German-Jewish background, and for mm -hmm. the most part, we didn't, uh, we had beets, like beet salads and pickled mm. beets, mm. but not borscht. Did you have shav? Not in my did, family. Did you have any cold soups? We had cold soup, but we would have called it sorrel soup. Yeah, it's very <laughs> modern to call it sorrel soup. <laughs> anyway, um, I just cut the beet. I just love to cut raw beets. I rarely do it. This is the only recipe I cut a raw beet for. Normally, I cook it first mm -hmm. because it's so much easier to peel it and cut it after right. it's cooked. And also but your hands, right? Your hands, well, yes, so you've been cooking, so <laughs> we've gotten our hands in it. But one of the things I love about cutting raw beets is this beautiful um, target shape in the middle. It's just oh, so, yeah. those dark lines, it's just lovely. And very similar to you, my beet borscht has the beets cooking in water mm -hmm. until they're soft and then blending. And I think the difference is that yours has onions right. and the water, and mine has scallions <laughs> added later, but it's very similar. And the thing that's so amazing, as I'm sure you know, is that this flavor infuses the water so you don't need a stock. So this is, this is um, all you do is cut them, put them in the water with onions, mm -hmm. right? little salt, sugar, and lemon. And what do you do with these? I know, yeah, you know, I used to always throw these away when I first started um, cooking vegetarian. I didn't, uh, my knowledge about greens, fresh greens, is kind of recent. And these are so nutritious, these beet greens. And these happen to be really beautiful ones. They're, they've got the beautiful vein going through. And they're, they're very bitter. They're full of nutrients. Mm -hmm. So what I would do with these, these I took these uh, greens off the beet mm -hmm. we just cut. I would cut them up. The, the stems are... Uh, you can either eat them or not. They're edible, but some people prefer not to. I would cut the stems very small, as, as in chard, and then mix these with other greens like kale, collard, 
collards are sweet, kale mm -hmm. are in between, mustard's really hot and sharp, mm -hmm. and make a nice mixture, but with very well-cooked onions to give it a sweetness mm. and balance it out. Mm. But don't throw these away, because they're so full of nutrition, iron especially. Well, there's actually a Moroccan Jewish recipe for uh, the beet greens, which is quite wonderful. I learned about these when I lived in Israel many, many years ago, and they do a similar thing to you, but they cut them and then they stir fry them with a lot of garlic and mm. olive oil. Mm. Put lemon juice on as a oh. salad, cold salad. That sounds wonderful. Delicious. Oh. That's so Swiss chard too. This. Greens yeah, Swiss interchangeable. Um, this is what it looks like after the beets have been cooked with the water and the onions and the lemon juice, the sugar, the salt. And of course, it's better to add salt while you're cooking something than later. You'll mm -hmm. add less and it'll meld the flavors mm -hmm. better. And let's puree it. Okay. Um, and we have a choice. We can make it really smooth or a uh, Textured. Oh, I love that. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. so nice. Yeah. Magical color. Yeah. Look at the bowl. I'm going to check it now and see how, how, uh, how it's doing. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, God, don't you love it? This color is unreal. Mm -hmm. It is so unreal. I think it's ready to pour. And color was something, too. This is one of the, 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 the few foods in Eastern European cuisine that had color. Yes, everything else was kind of all kind of gray, neutral, right? <laughs> Tasteful neutrals. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just so striking. And let's make, let's garnish. Let's do a bowl of one style and a bowl of another style. Absolutely. This is, my uncle Morty used to put um, fruit in his borscht. Now, where did you grow up? <laughs> I grew up in upstate New York, mm -hmm. um, and we had uh, cold beef borscht for lunch on certain Jewish holidays, especially Shavuot. Right. Of and some people would put in the sour cream, and some people would put in the hard-boiled egg, and some people would put in the potatoes. It looks gorgeous, Molly. How Isn't are you going to finish it? Well, I'm going to finish it two ways. One way is we're going to pour buttermilk, low-fat buttermilk, um, into one. And you want to stir it all up? Sure. And we'll see this transform into a lovely other color. Get that all mixed up. And this one, I'll finish with cucumber. Okay. Oh, that is so beautiful. I keep saying that. I'll keep but I just spoon keep the spoon in, and here comes the cucumber. And it sort of sinks, but it sort of peeks out the top. And Makes a downright gaudy little color contrast. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, let's just swirl this on top and not mix it in. Yeah, it's really good. a little swirl. Perfect. Beautiful. Yeah. And this one wants chives very this much. Wants chives. Should okay. we get really corny and do this? Oh, nice. Look at the spoon. Sure. There we All go. All right. So, oh. should we try taste these? Oh, shall we? Okay. I thought you'd never suggest it. Mmm. 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 Wonderful. Aggie Stern comes from a different background than Molly does, but she also evokes the memories of childhood in her kitchen. Aggie was born in Hungary and survived Auschwitz. She emigrated to Mexico after the war, raised her family there, and then moved to Miami. Aggie showed me how to make a palachinta, the perfect finish for a dairy meal. We're going to be making palachinka. A palachinta. And what, what is palachinta? And what does palachinta mean? What is it? It's a uh, blintz. Uh -huh. It's a Jewish, uh, Jewish, and Jewish is a blintz, but in Hungarian, it's palachinta. Uh, so they don't. And these are differences only because this one they don't have any any cheese. Uh -huh. You can eat it with uh, milk or don't milk. I see both yes, ways. Yes, about with. It's kosher. It's kosher, either way. If you don't put a, a, a milk. Uh, then you can eat with a meat meal. OK, well, let's can see I how you do this, Paula right. We can talk while you're. We have to put four eggs. OK. You want me to help you? Okay. No. No, you'll do it yourself. One. Yeah. Two. Three. OK. And four. You can do it for more or less, that it's not a... It depends how many people you have for it. Well, when do you make this? I make for uh, my family sometime, when they come to lunch every Sunday. And this is what they like the best of your dessert? Yes, they like it. <laughs> so it really is like a crepe, too? Yes, but it's a different uh, the style. I got gotcha. you. A teaspoon of sugar, okay. A teaspoon of sugar. Okay. And then? A teaspoon of salt. A teaspoon of salt. Here's a teaspoon of salt. Okay. One spoon. Tablespoon. Tablespoon. 
of what? Of water, mineral water. Or sparkling water, right? Okay. And then you mix it. When you make this, do you, at home, do you measure? Do you just do it? No, never. Never, okay. Never. Well, the, for us, Because gonna... my mother gave it to me, the, the recipe, we never know how much. Okay, this is what I want to see. How many tablespoons do you put in? I don't know. Heaping tablespoons. I One. want to see what happened. Okay, two heaping two. tablespoons. <laughs> this is why people like you make Three. it difficult to write cookbooks. Four. Four. Let, let's try. Four let's heaping four. tablespoons. So really, eight tablespoons, because those were very heaping. Okay. But we have to w wait what happened. Right. Four. <laughs> so you w race in this little town, and then... I, you went, I went to the uh, concentration camp in, in Auschwitz. In Auschwitz. I, I was one year in, in, in Auschwitz. Then I, I, I went to Mexico. Uh-huh. Okay, we've got a measure. We're doing this. No, we don't have to. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. You have to Here, see. Here, let's, let's just put it in a cup just so that. All right, if it, you want. Just to see how much you use. Okay. Very, very. You want me to put it in while you're that? doing it? Yeah. No, no, no. Keep it until it's, you get rid of all those little pieces. You want no, me to you, keep pouring it? All right, tell me how much. <laughs> That's it. That's it? Okay. So about a half a cup of milk. Yeah. Okay. So then from Auschwitz you went to Mexico, because you had family in Mexico, I come right? back to Hungary because I have to know where is there and who not. Who right. Because nobody was there. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Mexico because my mother, she has a lot of uh, brothers in Mexico. Uh -huh. And I married in Mexico. I have my children in Mexico. Mm -hmm. They married three of my children in Mexico, and then we came here. Uh -huh. What do we do next? I need my... What do you need? It has to be pourable, but not too thin. Not that. Okay. All right. Let's see what we're going to do now. Make these crepes. Yes. I really want to watch a pro. Yes. Palachinta. Palachinta. Okay. I don't know if it's a very professional, but it's a palachinta. A, a long-time palachinta <laughs> maker, right? Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's not going to be good. Uh, it's going to be perfect. Yeah. No. So first you take about, what, it's about two tablespoons, right? And you swirl it around. Yeah. Does it take a long time to not make this? Uh, when I first tried to do, they all fell apart. Look at this, perfect. It's perfect. Are you sure? It looks pretty perfect to me. <laughs> and then you just leave it a few seconds, right? Maybe a few seconds. When you when you see it's a uh, have some bubbles. Yeah. Then you. Uh, then you. you See? You put a knife ready. underneath yeah. it and then and you then just you wait. <laughs> so you don't. Yes, you do. Look at the way you do that. How come yours didn't fall apart? Look at this. The first one is good. You're ah. a professional. What can I tell you? This is something that you make for special occasions like birthdays. It's a special occasion because it will take a long time. Mm -hmm. And you have to be really relaxing and everything. and that. So you must yeah, be relaxed. I, You're doing such a good job. And this is, this is a very easy. It's not easy to do. It. Right. But it's so nice. It's very nice. When you serve, serve this one, everybody knows you love this person. Uh -huh. You give it for lo with love. With if you want soda. to eat with uh, meat, you meat, have right. to do it with uh, water. Just water or meat. soda water? Or soda water. But if you want to eat them with... Uh, with, uh, with milk, you can do it with milk. Right. So you did them both ways. Uh, both ways. So that when you made them... I don't think this is a good uh, with water. It's not. I never eat that. Uh, not now. You made it with milk, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know in my home it's not kosher. Mm -hmm. And I can do it. <laughs> but when you were growing up, it was different. Yeah. So that your mother probably made it with goose fat, right? <laughs> Yeah, because we, we said we never going to be kosher when you come back for the concentration camp. You said that? 
Yes, because in the Kam again, Auschwitz, we say, is God, it's not existed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you really... Yeah, it was horrible, and we have to do something. It's not... Before and the God, God can uh, permit it to have this kind of a life doesn't exist. So God doesn't exist? No. We, we're thinking about but it's. Do you still feel that way? No. No more. I think it's something you have to be existed because we existed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't go to speak. <laughs> right. We're going to make the palachita. That's it. something positive, happy, right? Yeah. I am very happy. I am a happy woman because I have everything but I have. But you lost a lot, huh? A lot. <laughs> We're going to assemble the palachinta tort. Well, we have already the palachinta. Right. We put here. Put one. One. In a and casserole. And we put the jam. So at about a tablespoon? Or a teaspoon, right? Or a teaspoon. A teaspoon. You don't have to put a lot. Okay. Because it's too sweet. Right. And then what do you put? The other palachinta. Oh, you don't put the nuts? Okay. No, the other one is with nuts. Uh-huh. So. so let's take... You put them together in a bowl. Is that what it is? Yes, it's the same thing. Okay, then you sprinkle a teaspoon of nuts. And then the sugar. About... That's it. About a half a teaspoon of sugar. And then the other palachinta, and you have to put it. Here, can I try to do yes. it? Yes. Okay. And then you just spread it like this. You are a good to On the, the top, top, you end top. it with the nuts. We okay, and with the nuts and the sugar on top. Yeah. Okay. And then you just bake it in the oven like this? About uh, 50 minutes. All right, let's put it in the it's oven. Ready. I can't wait to yes. eat it. These have been in the oven for 15 minutes. Yes. And you can see the, some of the, the sugar is already crystallized or caramelized. Now tell me what you do when you're 11 grandchildren at your house. What I have to do when I make it? When you serve it. Show me how. This is a link from Hungary to Florida, right? From Florida, yes. Oh, maybe it's uh, the Floridian is now, right? before. So you cut it in pie shapes. In pie, yes. That's up for everybody. It's enough. And then, up. Um. Okay. Okay. Mmm. It's too good, no? It's too good. Thank you, Aggie. Mmm. That's a Wonderful. Pleasure. To learn more about Jewish cooking in America with Joan Nathan, visit us online at www.pbs.org. Companion products for Jewish cooking in America, including Joan Nathan's updated cookbook, a CD of the music score, and a two-hour video of series highlights and recipes, are available by calling 1-800-235-3000. Credit cards are accepted. Jewish cooking in America with Joan Nathan is made possible by the Joseph S. and Diane H. Steinberg Charitable Trust, proud supporters of the arts, children's causes, and the preservation of Jewish heritage. And by Hebrew National, proud sponsors of Jewish Cooking in America, serving you and your family traditional kosher franks and delicatessen products since 1905. Hebrew National, we answer to a higher authority. And by Lenders Bagels. Our idea of a perfect day is warm and comforting and satisfying all around. Lenders Bagels, the perfect circle. And by the following private individuals and family foundations.
This has been a co-production of Joan Nathan, Frappe Productions, and Maryland Public Television. This is PBS.